Give me six reasons why software development doesn't suck. So you can't do it. Everybody agrees that software development sucks. <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons for this. One is like technical. Getting computers to do what you want them to do can be very difficult. Uh, but mostly, it's humans. Humans are really strange people. You gotta deal with like managers, you gotta deal with meetings, scheduling, deadlines, all this stuff. And that's really what makes software development tricky. It becomes sort of a problem to have to deal with all this sort of stuff. And people have come up with ways to deal with this as best as they can. These are things with you know, agile, waterfall, pair programming, BDD, TDD, all that stuff, whatever is popular at that given moment. And I've tried all of them, and if they work for you, that's great, because software development is hard. But for those of us, okay. For those of us who don't buy into the whole Agile stuff, um, it, it sucks because I want to be that guy who's really into their process and into their workflow because if you can identify with something that works really well for you, that's amazing. And for the longest time I thought I was just weird, I still do, and I just, you know, I wanted something that really worked well for me. And I think to the point, uh, the last year or two um, at GitHub, we've sort of uh, come down and figured out a development process that is really interesting. It doesn't feel like process. It's really quick, it's really fast, it scales really well. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. So this is not the Safari, well it sort of is. Uh, this is how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. Um, the secret here is that this isn't really about GitHub. I'm lying, I use GitHub three times in the title, so it's sort of about GitHub. But what I mean by that is that this is not about GitHub the tool. Um, you know, I'll talk about uh, GitHub the tool because it's easy to um, use it as an example for stuff, but I really want to talk about our workflow, our process, and how we use our tools and how we choose our tools, and why that makes for a really fun uh, development environment. So I don't think this is really about GitHub. If I worked for Twitter, I would give the same talk. If I worked for Facebook, I want to give the same talk. I want this to be a talk for making you think about how your company can use the processes and workflows that we use to improve your own product. So I'm Zach Holman, I'm Holman on Twitter, I'm Holman on GitHub. Uh, I do work for GitHub. It's a social coding site. Um, and I'm, I'm employee number nine, so I've been there for about a year and a half now. Um, and we're now 46, 47 employees. So we've grown a lot. And I've been able to be there for a year and a half and see what hasn't worked out for us, how we've changed our workflow, and more importantly, what has worked for us. What assumptions have we made in the beginning that we've been able to keep with us the entire time? So first of all, I want to talk about a little bit about how we work, otherwise this talk will probably sound insane. Um, the big part of what we do is we work asynchronously. So what does this actually mean? I looked this up in a dictionary and it said, uh, you can do shit without needing to pull me out of the zone. <laughs> I read real edgy dictionaries. <laughs> but it's, what's so important for us is that getting people in the zone is really important. This is the difference between going to work and you're not in the zone and you're trying to constantly battle and trying to you know, force yourself to write code. And it's one of those cases where you know, throwing hours at the problem doesn't solve things. With software development, you want to be in the zone because when you're in the zone, you can do as much in an hour as you can you know, 20 hours out of the zone. So we want to get more people in the zone for our employees as much as possible. And to do that, we have no meetings, no deadlines, no managers which is you know, kind of insane. You can do it too. Fire all the managers. You can tell them I said that. Um, it's, it's, it goes back to this really works for us. It's a very uh, fun place to work because it gets people in the zone as much as possible. So what, does that, what do I mean by that? One, chat rooms. We do everything in chat room. This sort of stems from when GitHub was a three-person company. They did everything online. We didn't have an office for the first two-ish years. Um, and this really permeates through everything. If it's you and me at the office at two in the morning, no one else is around, we're at the same table, we're still gonna talk in the chat room. Um, the reason for that is that partially it lets everybody see what's going on. There's a lot more visibility in the company. I can go out to lunch, I can go to Kansas City, and when I come back, whenever I get on the internet, uh, I can see exactly what happened to the company in the specific areas, and it's a much easier way of like letting everybody get involved. And there's no more secret projects where only, oh, that guy knows that project, you'll have to talk to him and arrange a time, because that sucks. Do you actually do that? Do what? Do you actually go back after going to Kansas City and then leave three days involved? 
Um, yes, it depends. Um, so as an aside, uh, we have a bunch of campfire rooms. We have like 20 or 30 now. Um, I don't read the danger room because that's all the animated GIFs and Qbot reigns supreme. That's insane. But specific ones where I'm really involved with, like GitHub Enterprise, I'll go back and read the transcript from the last few days and stuff like that. Uh, we want to break out as much as possible into separate groups. And then it becomes much more manageable to see what's going on in your uh, domain of responsibility. Um, and then lastly, time flexibility. Work when you want to work. This is really important. Um, we have a lot of people coming into the office at like 6 in the morning. That's definitely not me, because um, I'm not productive at that point. Like, we want people to be productive as much as they can. And some people are super productive in the morning, and they cannot do work at night, and that's cool. I'm totally the opposite. And you, mandating that you have to come in at a certain time, leave at a certain time, just damages that. It, gets, it brings people out of the zone. Um, so I wrote about this uh, three parts and stuff. If you want to check that out, you can. Um, but I want to get on to actual other stuff. Let's talk about pull requests and branching. Uh, I think this is a huge part of why GitHub works as well as we do. I want to talk about issues. I want to talk about OAuth as identity, hooks and Hubot, and secrets. So first, pull requests and branching. Um, this is sort of the most interesting part of GitHub, I think. Um, you guys have really weird branches. And I see this pull request come in, and someone just details their process, and like your jaw just kind of drops in each paragraph. Like, how do you work in this fashion? And like, by this I mean like, there was one company I saw who has a master branch. Makes sense. Then they cut a deploy branch every time they want to do deploy. Makes sense. But then they just cut a deploy branch off of each individual deploy branch. So by the end of this, you have no idea where the hell you are. This is just insane. It's overly complicated. You don't need to do this stuff. Um, more likely, I see this a lot in large enterprise companies. Uh, you have a repository that you work on, then you have a group of trusted developers. These are the guys with full rewrite access to the repo, and they can do whatever they want. And then you have a group that's, I call them. <laughs> I call them shitty developers because they're obviously must be shitty if they put them on this separate side and they only give them read access, and they're trying to set up all these arbitrary guidelines. And it just seems really insane to me. Um, so what you have is like they all have to fork their own project from the main repository. All those forks then have to go back to the trusted developers for them to figure out, okay, is this good to go back in the real repository? If it's not, then you got to send back to the shitty developers, and then they have to pull down new changes to the repository. If you see a chart like this in your organization, something is fucked up. <laughs> Keep your branches simple. I think this is really important. This is fundamentally important. This is sort of the foundation where you build your product. All right. No. All right. Oh. I'm trolling you now. Let's just say if someone here has that fork charge, what's the solution? You mean the stuff I was going to cover in the next minute? <laughs> Because I think, obviously, we have a perfect branching situation here, Dr. Nick. <laughs> what we have is a master branch. And then we have a branch where you work on a bug fix or a uh, feature or anything like that. When you're done with that, that goes into master. This is it. That's the entire branching strategy. We don't really branch off of separate branches or do anything more complex than this. And it becomes a lot easier to bring on somebody new and just say, oh, you cut a branch. When that's ready to go in, push it to master. Along with that, everybody can push, everyone can deploy. Our designer on their first day can deploy to GitHub. Um, we have a lot of automation surrounding uh, you know, deploying to the 50 plus servers we have now. And that's good. We want people to have responsibility over the code that they actually write. Um, too many times you have something where like a release manager where you push it to the release, release manager and then that becomes their responsibility for the stuff. We want people who write the stuff to be responsible. Uh, this also frees yourself up from micromanaging other people's code, like the trust developers and the shade developers part. You want people to be responsible for their own code. 
Um, for us, master is always deployable. This is like the one hard rule that is constant at GitHub. If you push to master, assume it can be deployed as soon as it passes CI. Um, the reason we do this is because we deploy 10 to 40 times a day. We like very short changes, and if something breaks, you know exactly what breaks really quickly. Um, if you're nervous, you can deploy to staging. We have a separate staging environment. We can also deploy separate branches, um, and then test that out, and then deploy to master afterwards. You can also deploy to a subset, so if you could say like, uh, let me just deploy to two boxes right away and then see if anything blows up. If it doesn't, then merge it into master and deploy from there. Um, this is also sort of tr Twitter driven development because you guys are way more on top of things than we are sometimes, and like people will tweet constantly if something <laughs> breaks. And we have like graphs and stuff where like, you know, number of exceptions and then the deploy is really marked on the graph, and then we mark that against uh, at replies to GitHub on Twitter. And it's actually very proportional to, you know, if you break something, people will talk about it. So keep your branches simple. Um, that's really important. I know what you guys are thinking. You know, what about code quality? If you have a fucking designer in there messing with your code, no one likes designers, they do weird stuff. Um, so how do you keep up code quality? And our response to that is pull requests. This is central to everything we do. Pull requests are code review. What are pull requests? Pull requests are a discussion. It's, it's a simple discussion about a piece of code, a distinct piece of code. Um, it's a discussion about code, it's a discussion about that particular feature, discussion about that particular strategy. All of this stuff comes together, you can do a bunch of different stuff to it, um, you can reference issues in it, you can reference other bits of code diffs in it, you can write code comments. It's all about figuring out how you make a discussion on a piece of code, and then from that point you can figure out, do you want this in the actual code base? All this stuff happens on a separate branch. So none of this stuff ends up being dangerous because it's separate from your production code until it's ready. This is what it looks like. I'm sure most of you guys actually know what pull requests are. Um, but you know, it's title, description, bunch of commits. Once those commits are done, you can discuss on those commits and discuss some more, and then you commit, and then you get merged back into master or whatever branch that you're trying to merge it into. Um, the pull request itself is broken out into a discussion where you can actually talk about the changes, uh, the commits where you can show all the commits, and then the diff where you can actually see what has actually changed in the code. And this is really cool because we're really large at GitHub at this point, and no one person can really dig into every line of code that's changed, but it's important that you have a lot of people know what you're doing. So for a lot of pull requests, I won't look at the actual code, I'll just look at the discussion and see like the title description, and that's a good way, it's sort of like an RSS of what development is happening without having to sit down and do a stand-up meeting or anything like that. I can just see it in my inbox as it goes by, and it's very simple. So I lied, this isn't actually our development strategy. Uh, it's more similar to this, where you branch off, send a pull request, and then merge it into master. And that's sort of the, the guard against getting really shitty code deployed accidentally. Um, so big secret number one, you don't need to fork anything. This is sort of a common misconception. Um, you can do pull requests between branches on the same repo, and that's what we do uh, consistently at GitHub. We don't fork the main GitHub repo all the time. We just do pull requests between individual branches and then you don't have to set up weird permission strategies to let people under your different forks and stuff. It's just a much simpler way to do things. So why are pull requests actually rad? Four reasons. One, they're asynchronous. No meetings. Um, everybody's had that time where you're in a code review in person and you're projecting code on the wall and you're trying to figure out like, okay, you're running it through your MRI in your head and you're trying to figure out, okay, this compiles to this and does this. It's a terrible way of reviewing code. With pull requests, you can easily pull down the diff and run it locally. And you can do that whenever you want. You don't have to have a separate meeting on that stuff. It's really helpful to have it broken away from some sort of synchronous, like, this has to get reviewed right now and stuff like that. Um, secondly, email is a good interface for this, too. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I can see all the pull requests that have been generated from Europe, for example. And so again, it's just a quite easy way to figure out what's going on in the company without mandating some stand-up, which doesn't even work when half your team is across the world. Um, they're also really accessible, and we use this a lot. Designers evolve entire mockups in a pull request, and that's really powerful too. It's like sort of version control for mockups. You can see as you go along what the, what the, the mockup has changed over time. You can discuss on that too. Um, we also have a bunch of non-technical staff, like we have a, a shipper who ships out all your beautiful shop stuff, and 
she can go on and check out a pull request. Like, this is going to change the shop.github.com site. Can you actually say, like, does this make sense? Yeah, she doesn't have to go see the code diff, but she can see what's actually happening and you know, check it out. Uh, they're also historical. They can be experiments, and they should be experiments. We have a lot of pull requests that are designed not to ever get deployed because we want to see, okay, what do you guys think about this interface? What do you think about this API? Like, does this make sense? If it does, then I can just close the pull request and then actually build it for real. Don't be afraid to try something out, throw it away, because GitHub retains the history, and they should be really fun to, to make. You should not have to fear about doing some insane experiment when you're drunk and seeing how it works out. So I want to show you just a couple of quick pull requests that we do at GitHub. Um, it's a little bit more context. Status.github.com, there was a problem a while ago, again, where you guys caught stuff before we did, or more, uh, more correctly, we would get like the notifications that something is down, but it took us another couple minutes to actually update the status site. So I added something, uh, just real-time polling of different services on github.com, just to see if they're up, and this is a pull request. Now it started out just with a bare bones interface, and I just dumped this on a page. It would check this, and I didn't have to care about styling or anything like that, because I knew once I posted this, somebody would come in and be like, I want to design that. And it, that's what we have a lot, where designers are just going to sort of you know, see what's happening in the company, and when it's ready for them to come in, they'll do a design. At that point, I have a design, and I can build on that, I can commit to that design, and then just match it, and it's very easy for me. I never have to worry about that in the slightest, and there's no upfront meetings. It just all happens very asynchronously. By the end of it, we close it, merge it, ship it, and that's it. It's very simple, very easy. You should not be afraid to mix your designers and developers. They should work together. Uh, just, like, pull requests are kind of scary from a designer's point of view, but they don't have to get into the nitty gritty if they don't want to. It's, it's helpful for them to get into the discussion section. Don't be afraid to post screenshots a lot. Um, you, can use, do, you can use this in the markdown, um, which I'll show you in a couple seconds, but um, it's very good to be very visual, even on back end stuff. Um, you can also post GIFs because they're funny. We do that a lot. Um, we also have something called uh, code editing, or it's a syntax highlighting in your code editor. And this was like earlier this year, and this entire pull request, we did all this stuff, did this bunch of discussion, and then we're like, fuck it, it doesn't work. We can't do it, close it, and that's it. That's important, that's still really good, because they're cheap as hell. You shouldn't be afraid to experiment. <laughs> That seemed really kind of a bummer at first because we really wanted this to work out, but the, the library we were using didn't work out. Don't be afraid to toss it away. This was great because five or six months later, we found a different library that did it a lot better and integrated that and it worked how we wanted it to work. And we could go back to the original pull request and say, what was my design decisions here? What did I want to do here? And then you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So really play around with pull requests. This is a pull request that started in the beginning of this year, hasn't shipped yet. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff in it, and that's really cool. We can hire somebody tomorrow, and if they're asking what they want to work on, we can point them to this. There's no you know, back alleyway deals about like, you know, uh, communicating between two people, and then, then you'd have to chase down somebody else and be like, can you please tell me what your thoughts are on this? It's all right here, and we can go back later and check it out. Get shit done, don't waste your time. Um, just. This is something that you have to constantly worry about. Like, can you improve your workflow? Can you make it a lot better? And it's something that you have to do constantly because otherwise they'll sneak up on you and really fuck you down the road. So recap, use pull requests more. They're awesome. Ship a lot more. Um, I think they're really great. I think they're really important. And if you are able to do them in your company, I think you should investigate them. I want to talk about issues. Everybody has issues in different companies. I'm talking about like tickets, bugs, stuff like that. Um, so, everybody's seen a screen like this, like a new issue create screen. Um, the problem with this is there's a lot of stuff going on here. And some of it makes sense, and you're like, okay, yeah, that's cool, and then they just layer more and more stuff on there. Before you know it, there's some fucked up shit going on there. <laughs> you're trying to figure out what, what is the point of all this stuff. You know, like duplicating priorities and stuff like that. This is the one on github.com. And this is not, again, about GitHub. This is the tool we choose internally. All it is is title, description. And we do away with the whole bunch of priorities and craziness because, for the most part, you don't need them. Ask yourself, can you survive on simpler tools? Can you work better and faster on simpler tools? I think you can. Um, 
Merlin Man, I sort of have a, a man crush on him, Twitter crush. He's amazing. He wrote this awesome uh, post on email priorities. And he said, priorities was there not manufactured or assigned, otherwise it's necessarily not a priority. Maybe something a big red top top, big highest number one priority changes in nothing but text styling for a really important it already be done, period. I think that's really important. He's talking about email, but the same is true for stuff across the board. Issues, prioritization, dragging, dropping, like all these issues to prioritize and stuff. Think about if you actually need that. If you do, that's cool, then use it. But if you don't need that, you're wasting a lot of time. Look at all the stuff that we have as developers. Ask me to get rid of all of it. Resist adding meta work. It gets in the, the way of real work. The real work will get done. Um, quickly, we use issues for three things. Shit something broken. Um, something is broken, that gets fixed in a few hours. That's it. We also use issues a lot for, wouldn't it be cool if, and then you, it's another place to have a discussion. This is prior to the pull request, because you don't want to throw it on code yet, but it's fun to talk about. We also use this to-do list sometimes. Um, that's just kind of an easy way. You don't have to set up a weird uh, you know, issue tracking you know, to-do board or something like that. It's all just one, in one issue. Do you need more than that? Really think about that, because most of the time you don't. Sometimes you do, which is fine, but most of the time you don't. Simple tools means a better product because you can build it simpler. Okay, OAuth is identity. Um, this is fun. I love Ruby. I really love Ruby. I'm not talking about like the speed of Ruby, because it is slow as dicks. <laughs> I'm talking about like how fast it is to build something. Like it is really fast to build something. So I look through my development folder about what projects I have in there, and I have one called Secretary of Labor, all caps. I was really drunk when I wrote this, and I saw in the next morning it's just a single Sinatra app, and it's got a Ceph referential sim link called what that points to itself. I have no idea what it does. I have one called Unmarked Van, which tracks people's physical locations. I have one called Trace, which is a real-time stats graphing in Redis. The point is, all this stuff was really fun to make. It was fun to experiment. None of this stuff is ever shipping. Especially not that first one. But it's fun to try stuff out. And we do this stuff at GitHub, too. We have a bunch of internal apps. We have, you know, probably have more than this at this point, but some of them are more fun. Some of them are very serious, CI, stuff like that. We have an internal Twitter, which is more fun, status updates and stuff like that. The point is that we want people to experiment. It keeps things really fun. It keeps things interesting. The problem with all of this is that outsiders aren't welcome. Like, we're a really open company, but you don't want people just trudging through all your stuff. So yeah, add some authentication layer. For us, we use GitHub for that authentication layer. We have all of our teams, we have our orgs, we have everything in GitHub. So we just use OAuth to uh, attack that and use that as our authentication in all of these separate mini apps. You guys probably all seen the screen, the, the, you know, allow them to check out your profile, yes, no. Um, you can use this in a bunch of different ways. There's a whole bunch of different uh, Ruby uh, OAuth libraries. Um, this is one done by Atmos. All we have to do is just check whether or not they're a member of the GitHub org. If they are, let them in the app. It's very easy. If we you know, hire somebody, um, we don't have to update the 30, 40 different apps we have. It's all in one place. Uh, it's just a nice, consistent way of doing things. Think about like if, if you have this problem, can you pawn it off on somebody else? And that means GitHub. Um, a lot of people have Twitter now. You can use Twitter's authentication for that. Um, or, you know, if, if you're big enough, you have your own internal LDAP server or whatever you got. Just don't reinvent the wheel. Um, it's good to use a consolidated uh, uh, feature for all this stuff. Okay, let's talk about Qbot. Everybody know about Qbot? So three. <laughs> so Qbot's our friendly campfire bot. Um, he's cool, he can do some stuff. We have like 300 commands for us. You can deploy every GitHub app. Um, this is important when you have 50 some servers because you have no idea um, how to deploy all that stuff. So we just say Hubot deploy X to production and he does it. It's great. Um, you can run branch level tests. So if you push a branch up, um, that will just run automatically. You can play music in the office. Uh, you can tell us who is in the office based on their Wi Fi presence, on their MAC address, on their phone, or their uh, laptop. You can build usage graphs, like you can chart all those exceptions versus deploys versus Twitter mentions. Send or receive text messages. You can mustache every image posted in chat, like that. Uh, you can track who swears the most every day. You know, we can do all this stuff, and it's more fun because it's a shared side project. Again, it's fun to have experimentation. Use cool technologies. It's too bad he's not open source. I'm just fucking with you. He's now open source as of like last week, and it's awesome. We have like tons of adapters now. You can use them in IRC, Campfire, 
uh, XMPP, and tons of stuff. So check them out if you haven't already. Um, this is a really fun project you can have inside your company. Um, in terms of how we use them for GitHub, um, we use them a bunch of different ways. Specifically, we use them for branch status a lot. You can ask him about what hasn't been deployed, and he'll return a compare view of what hasn't been deployed yet. So you know if you're going to deploy this, these are the concrete disks that haven't been deployed yet, and be worried about these if you deploy them. Um, we can do this on a different branch too. So if you're going to deploy a separate branch to production, or you know, or you want to know what on that branch hasn't been merged in a master yet, um, you can do all this. And it all stems from the SHA, which we know what is the currently deployed code on GitHub because it's all in uh, this one site. It's just an endpoint, and you can use this all over the place, like CI stuff like that. Um, it's just a nice, helpful way of doing that, and you can build into compare views, and it's fun. Um, you can also use a lot of the API in GitHub too. Um, I can ask it what are the pull requests on my particular repository, and it'll spit back all the pull requests. Very simple, very easy, and it becomes uh, a nice way of uh, setting up a to-do list. If you're ever like, what should I work on today? This is a nice way to start. Um, we also have the same thing for issues. We have bug days every like second Thursday or so, just as a way to clear out old issues. And this is kind of fun. You can ask it how many issues did we close today, and you know it'll respond back how many issues you closed today. It's another way of sort of you know, I hate the word, but like gamification of like your work. It's fun to be like, oh, can we do more issues knocked out this week than we did the last time? It's fun. Think about what you can automate at your company. Because the stuff that really sucks are the things that you have to repeatedly do over and over again. And we're developers. It's, it's fun to over-engineer stuff sometimes. And like, you'll spend way more time automating something than you think you'll get out of it. But you'll actually get a lot more out of it than you probably think. Plus, it's really fun to do. So the moral of the story, Hubot knows where we live. I, I don't know, he's freaky. Um, finally, I just want to talk about some secrets. I want to blow through these, because uh, GitHub's got some funny secrets. We tuck stuff away sometimes. Our bad. Um, here's some fun stuff you can have. Uh, emoji, all those fun things. We do these on pull requests all the time. We just plus one stuff. Um, we say heart. I don't know, it's fun. It's a fun way of getting people involved on stuff really cool. Um, go to that link to see a whole list of emoji and stuff like that. All my slides are up on uh, my site later. You can check out these links and stuff later. Um, shortcuts, uh, if you guys don't know all this stuff, W will bring up the branch selector on a repo page. Uh, T will do the find in project, sort of like the text mate find in project really quick. Um, and if you press a uh, question mark on any page, it'll bring up the help dialog. And there's a, a crap ton of shortcuts you can do to do a bunch of different stuff. Issues, for example, has a whole bunch of quick access to issues. Um, images, images are awesome, especially when they're animated. Uh, this is the markdown format for uh, posting an image into issues. Um, this will post the image. Unfortunately, this only works if your dorky dodgeball team is the image. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's our dodgeball team. Check out those shorts. Amazing. Um, the other one is, what? Who won dodgeball? I can't remember. <laughs> is that some Heroku guy who asked that? Yeah. Heroku won dodgeball. We raised 50 grand. It was great. For charity, not for Heroku. Um, also, different patch. I mean, Git was based on a mailing list um, point of view, so all of the stuff that we expose on GitHub is also available in text, basically. So just add dot .git, uh, dot .diff or dot .patch after most URLs, and we'll spit out a nice thing that you can put directly into Git later. Um, the other thing we have is friends code. Um, this is sort of a, you get the formatting of any code that you paste into issues, pull requests, stuff like that. All you have to do is triple tick and then say what language you want, and then it'll syntax highlight for that language. A nice quick thing to do, especially do it in readmes, because readmes with just blocks of code in them kind of sucks. It's nice to have that syntactically highlighted. Mentions, we use this a lot. If you're going to open an issue, we'll usually add like cc, you know, at technoweenie or at defunct, and then that will notify them and get them to put their eyes on your pull request. It's a nice way of just having communication amongst your pull request issues, stuff like that. White space, you can add uh, question mark w equals 1 to reduce white space in diffs. Um, sometimes that's really helpful if some guy sent a pull request with a whole bunch of white space changes and you're like, I don't even know what you're changing. Quick and easy way to do that. Uh, repo references, uh, you can cross, you can reference issues and pull requests across different repositories. Um, so you just, in your uh, issue body, you just say like user slash repo number sign issues and then that will bring in the link on the referenced issue and it'll just connect the two visually in the, uh, the, the web page. It's kind of nice. 
Um, I have a pseudo announcement right now. We have a, a URL shortener we've been using for a while now. I'm announcing this here because I can. Um, so if you have a really long URL, you can shorten it to a git.io URL. Um, you do that via this. It's a very simple service. Um, the, the red URL down there is actually a gist that actually shows you how to set up a shell script to do all this for you. So if you ever want to tweet something or have some short URL, or if you want to snag one for your vanity URL, github.com slash home and stuff like that, that's a nice way to do it. Um, check out all these links in my talk later, slides. So as the recap, really think through all this stuff. This is the stuff that will bite you further down the line unless you really think it through each time. And the problem is that you don't notice it being a problem until it's too late. And at that point, you can't go back and fix it. So it's got to be a constant battle of like, what can I improve? How can I make my developers happier? Do I really need all this extra stuff? And then I think you can make cool products. So thanks. <laughs>